starting the meeting yet, but um, what I do want to do is welcome everyone tonight. Um, I'm Virginia Chain Crawley, if you have the board president. And um, the reason I have some uses is because I want to pass this down officially to our youth president, Robert Jones. Congratulations, Robert. He is going to be an awesome president, and um, it's obviously a great honor to have served with you. And I think it's for the fire district, Robert. Um, you will be um, one of the busiest and fastest growing areas in the city of East Colorado. You're going to be awesome, and you're going to lead this board um, forward and so that we're representing all of the jurisdictions within the fire district. Thank you for meeting, and this is for you, and I think now we're going to hear you all. We're going to have to say eight. Before he actually uses the gavel. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you, Virginia, for your leadership last year, uh, and I want to thank the board members for your sets a nice tone for the city of East Palo Alto as well to have your, you as the leader of the board because the board, uh, for those that don't know, has oversight for the town of Atherton, the city of Memo Park, and appropriate county areas, four different pockets there, the city of East Palo Alto, and also the Stanford Linear Accelerator and their laboratories. So 29 square miles, seven stations, 143 personnel, a little over 9,000 calls a year, and five elected board members. So it's a great a great responsibility that the board has to keep that running every uh, every day. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Solano. Here. Okay. 
the final version, which the uh, ESCI, the company, will be presenting to you on January 29th from 4 to 6 p.m. for anybody that's going to be interested in that meeting. That's a significant uh, move forward, I think, with that document, which will spur things that will help you uh, on your planning meeting, which is on February 4th. I have a semi-annual chief's meeting, a manager's meeting on the 30th with my staff, so we can go through last year's accomplishments and this year's goals. So we'll be ready for the board planning meeting as well on the 4th. Uh, the anniversary, 10-year anniversary, tragic anniversary of the B Street aircraft crash is coming up on February 17th. Uh, a lot has changed, but a lot, unfortunately, is still the same. Uh, we have the annual Lions Club Service Awards that uh, we've received one nomination for this year internally, which we'll discuss at our January 30, 30 meeting with the staff. Uh, that's on March 27th. That's every year for the Valor Heroism and Service Awards for the Lions Club. Uh, we believe the space needs report will be done by April. We had a conversation about that today with uh, John Hitchcock, who's been supervising that process and walking through all the different options on space needs. We still need to dedicate the heavy rescue, the airboat, the tech ops vehicle. Uh, we don't have a date for that. And then uh, to some of the different jurisdictions, uh, Director McLaughlin and I attended both meetings, Director Salon the last one as well, both in December and January, with the town of Atherton, who is discussing based upon an equity issue they have a concern about uh, possible disillusionment or uh, separation from the fire district, so that's continuing to move forward as well. Uh, here in the city of East Palo Alto, uh, Fire Marshal Johnson and I met with the city manager and talked about uh, water supply, traffic congestion, and specifically growth. Uh, same thing at City of Mellow Park, uh, we talked about a number of issues with the city manager, which they have their planning meeting coming up on January 30th. And in San Mateo County, uh, with the Public Safety Communications Facility, the new Urbers Operations Center, uh, we, have, we have a, uh, the crews are doing tours to view and look at that new, new building. And some of you were there for the dedication of that facility, which is now up and running. Uh, PSC, I'm still working with the chief, or former Chief Belleville on the agreement with them, which will go before the MSJPA, hopefully next month when we finish that. Uh, we had our annual county fire chiefs retreat. Uh, we did that for two days up in Napa, and I'm happy to tell you, with the five new chiefs out of ten, and almost all new deputy chiefs, uh, Chief Stevens was there with me. I think we actually covered a lot of ground. It's actually nice to see forward movement and some of the energy that the newer chiefs will bring to their positions, and kind of a longer view, I think, than maybe some of those that were there before. Uh, I met with Palo Alto Fire Department, Chief Blackshire. Uh, he's been in the position for a short period of time. I listened to some of his challenges, and obviously we're always looking to try to improve our relationship with our neighbors. So we had some good dialogue about things that are, that are going on and the challenges that Palo Alto faces, which is much like Redwood City. Um, you know, they're being asked to cut their budgets or stay status quo. Uh, they're unable to grow despite the boom economy, and I know they've got a lot of things that obviously that affects, which is, you know, problematic for them. And, and, and sad to see, I think, in a lot of ways, especially within the economic uh, condition that we're in. Um, we have a meeting and have had meetings with Facebook on several different levels, specifically the Willow Village. We just recently met with the vendor, and then we were talking with them on different things that are, that are coming up. Uh, I'm working with Slack. Uh, we've got a date set where our contract with them expires in April. So hopefully we'll be able to work out an update with the Stanford Lear Accelerator and propose that to the board for your approval. Uh, and then Fleet Services, we acquired another 56 C grade, which is the actual sequential brother, if you will, of the one that we have. Uh, we did that with two-thirds of the cost coming from donations. We also purchased the uh, San Francisco Tiller ladder truck that was being used as a trainer that was being borrowed from the city and county of San Francisco. And uh, earlier this year, or actually last year, I said that we had been able to sell one of our former reserve engines for $100,000, which was the first time I've ever seen that. Sadly, now we're not able to get rid of one of the engines because nobody's either buying them or because they don't like the, 
condition, make and model year, whatever it is. So we have not received any bids for one of our older, uh, now out of service, past reserve uh, lifespan engine companies. And equally for uh, our rescue, the old rescue one, which I think was purchased in what, 94? Yeah, it's 20 something years old. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's fairly old, but still a great piece of equipment. And as much as I hate to see it go, we, you know, we have to can't add things and not get rid of things. So those, so far there are no bidders for that. So we're looking at entities that see that as a donation opportunity and we'll be bringing that before you as well. And then uh, recently met with uh, new President Jones, new President McLaughlin, and we set the agenda and look forward to working with both of you this year. That's my report. Are there any comments for the I wanted to ask about a couple of the events that are coming up. Sure. The, the meeting on the standards of cover, January 29th, will that be at the regular classroom? Yes. Okay. So I'll be at Station 1, and I know uh, because of scheduling, you had some concerns. So we adjusted it forward from the evening to 4 to 6 p.m. because that was a slot you said would work for your calendar. Okay. And I know Director McLaughlin cannot be there, but was okay with moving forward with that item so that it fit within the planning meeting schedule after that on February 4th. That was, that was my other question, because it, it didn't specify a time, and according to the tentative calendar that's in here, we have committee meetings on February 4th. How, how, how do you envision that happening? So Director Jones and I discussed this, and one of the things that when we looked at calendar, tried to do it, as you know, we pulled people for the Saturday, uh, looked at the week before, talked to both Director McLaughlin and Jones about what we could schedule this. Based upon the content of the meeting being an overarching planning meeting, it was discussed to having that on that day. So that would set the tone in lieu of the committee meeting to spend anywhere from four, six hours, whatever the decision would be made on that meeting. That has we have a, we have a couple things. Location still needs to be found on that. Uh, Michelle's working on that. Hours need to be set. And then uh, facilitation, Director Jones is going to work on facilitation for that meeting. So it's still some un there's still some pieces that need to be worked out. <coughs> Can I just one? Sure, one more thing. As a resident of Menlo Park, who lives very close to the border with Palo Alto, uh, one of the things that's always concerned me is help from the southern flank of our district. And uh, most of the other cities, except for the, you know, most of the other cities get help from both sides. And not only did Palo Alto consolidate one of their pieces of equipment, I think between two different stations, but uh, apparently Mountain View is closing the station as well. And um, do you have any idea of that? I mean, we, I don't know that we get any direct assistance from Mountain View, but it seems to me that that could affect the assistance we could from Palo Alto. Yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's a good question. I mean, Palo Alto's got a lot of challenges, I can tell you right now. It was not a, um, it's not an easy conversation because I actually felt bad for the chief. I mean, he's been there a long time. He cares about his department. And, uh, you know, I don't understand all their fiscal challenges. I know that his engine that was hit on the freeway almost a year ago is still sitting in the corp yard and hasn't been fixed. He doesn't have a replacement for it. I know they have a station. The contractor went broke. I can't even imagine that in this economy, so the work stopped. He's got a lot going on. Mountain View, to your point, because they didn't agree with what Palo Alto does. Two of one rights and runs their own ambulances. Didn't like the method that they were going to use for response, so they essentially walked away from auto aid and now do mutual aid with the city of Palo Alto. We have never had a robust auto aid agreement with them, partially because you have the county EMS agreement, which states that essentially Palo Alto ambulances can't come into San Mateo County unless it's a vehicle accident on the freeway or a common area. So we don't we don't have the same relationship with Palo Alto that we do in this county, meaning that the ambulance system is separate, um, the engines go on call together, we support each other on the fires. But there is an issue with the separate dispatch, and there is an issue when it comes to how the two operate. I think we can do more.
However, you know, we don't necessarily have full control of that. You don't have full control of that as the board because at the end of the day, you have the county EMS authority that has to allow certain things to happen because of the exclusive operating agreement for transport ambulances. So, you know, it's, we're going to continue to chip away at what we can do to make it better. But, yeah, that, that, that creek is somewhat a moat in uh, different ways. And uh, they operate differently than we do, but, you know, we're both fire agencies. So. I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, I wish I, I wish I could be more specific on some of it. But, you know, if you're concerned about the numbers, you know, I think if you look at once we put out the report, we auto-aid and how many times back and forth, it's incredibly low. I don't know, Jim, do you remember what the auto aid numbers are for Palo Alto? I, I don't before? have the numbers in front of me. I but don't recall. But it's a very small number. Now, the one good thing that happened a few years ago is in auto aid, Palo Alto did not recognize the city of East Palo Alto, which I thought was a significant problem. They would not respond to East Palo Alto. And they made that change. But that was even written in the agreement that it said they were going to Menlo Park, but not East Palo Alto. That, that has been modified, that has been changed, and they will come into East Palo Alto on automatic aid for structure fires if needed. So. Uh, Chief, I have one question. <clears throat> uh, regarding the, uh, there's, I noticed that there were uh, uh, tours and protection of the Public Safety Communication Center and their right. Office of Learning Services. Uh, are, is that open? Would that be open to the board? Yeah, if the board members want to go on one of those, I mean, Chief Stevens can arrange it. I know Mike Schaefer and training set it up. I mean, what we wanted to do after the open house that they had, and we went in when they dedicated it, one of the things, you know, I like to do is, and I asked our guys to set it up, was to have all of our crews go through. I don't know that any other jurisdiction is doing that. Jim, do you know if there's more agencies, or are we the only one going through the PSC Center? Uh, typically, most, most agencies at least run their chief officers through and, and as much of their staff as they can. As they can. Um, I, I don't know which ones have been through it so far, but certainly we can talk to PSC and see what can be arranged. Yeah, I don't see that being a problem for board, if board members want to go through. I mean, now the center is fully operational, so it's it's a working it's a working facility now. I know I would like to go. As Jim just mentioned that he would like to go. Sure. Yeah, are there any other board members that yeah. think they might want to go? I would like to go. I already saw it. They got in the back. The old yeah. the back. I, I was there. I could, I would that, but I couldn't go on the tour. So if the three of us, uh, and maybe possibly another person, uh, could go? Uh, yeah, let us, let us uh, find out what days are still available. You can go what times they're doing it. Okay. You know, they're, they're, they like to show people now they're out of the basement after 50 years. Yeah, they, like, they got windows, they're on the second floor. It's beautiful. I heard it's a great, great facility. So it's, a, it's a great facility. With, they still have a problem with the uh, video wall. It doesn't work exactly the way it was supposed to. But the radios work. Yeah, that would be great if you didn't let us know. We'll, we'll reach out to them and get it arranged. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions for the team? Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, sir. You're welcome, Chief uh, So let's move on to uh, item in the tenth calendar. Uh, there are three items uh, on the tenth calendar. Is there one in favor of so moved? Second. Second, and so it's been moved second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we want to thank the chat. Uh, item number six, we want to move into the regular agenda item. Um, and item <coughs> six, Michelle, uh, 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 yep. item number six. I'm sorry, what? Item number six, we had item number six, do you have anything that you prepared? <coughs> no, just what was in the packet. So there is a recommendation to accept the report as presented uh, and uh, approve uh, the board president recommendation for the community to lay us on assignment for the telling year 20, uh, 2020. Um, and um, so the background information that was written, uh, the assignment, some consideration and thought on my part on the team to come up with the assignment based upon uh, some
one of the things that the Chief uh, <coughs> what is we moving forward with within each one of those assignment areas, uh, some of the goals and uh, that we get to get to that's going to be critical for us to kind of uh, think about and be very proactive uh, on. The liaison is a little bit more, um, the thought that went into assignments of that was, for example, I, I do know from my conversation with the people in the city of Palazzo that the, the JPA, the Creek, uh, there's some, some activity and movement around um, uh, expanding and because you know they're doing some work over there already. But for, I think for us as a district, if we are looking at trying to really uh, move the LRAT system uh, forward uh, in, in a way that, that incorporates uh, some type of alert system up and down the, the, the creek, that would be a good idea if we could, uh, to, to continue that, that conversation with the man as it were. Under the County of San Mateo, uh, District 3 and District 4, I felt that very helpful to be a representative of both Bob uh, Worsley and Warren Slocum. The way the county has split us in two, like that. And uh, I would like that to be well, myself representing both, uh, both districts and the county board of suits. Well, first, well, the goal was uh, putting that together, trying to put in parity, and putting uh, not to allow one group or two to, uh, to to share a lot of load and have to be a whole committee. If you're willing to swap and trade with someone else, then that I'm not okay with that. I don't want to know what we're going to do a lot. But that's what we, the reason why we are trying to put split into three and four of Yes, sir. I'd like to make a similar appeal, and I'd like to get the board support for it as well. Um, I, I don't feel that I got a fair share of assignments here. Um, I have three assignments. One of them is the uh, Creek JPA, which is really, in my opinion, a non-assignment. I have three, and I think, Robert, not only are you uh, president of the board, but you've given yourself four assignments. I'd like to make a plea for appointment to the Finance Committee. I think I have institutional knowledge that goes back four or five years. It's important. Um, there are a number of initiatives that are taking place on the Finance Committee in terms of, for example, capital budget, things like that that I've been working on, and I'd like to see those through. Um, and I'm also one of those people that reads everything in great detail, and I ask lots of questions. And it seems to me that I can both serve the district well by bringing up those things, but it also makes our general, if I can then ask them in a general meeting, it's going to delay our general meeting a lot longer. Um, and to have an hour to be able to ask them, it just would speed up our operations. So I would like to ask that I be appointed to the Finance Committee because of the expertise that I have. Well, I, I, I think the, uh, again, the decision, uh, I know I want to be on there, and the reason that Jamie is on there, because of the same institutional knowledge that you have, uh, I think she possesses as well. So that is, that's why we made the assignment. I think you've been on the finance committee for the last four years. And I think it's also for other board members, I think it's important to be able to experience different committees so as to, so as to put that would bring that board with the knowledge and experience up as well uh, before. So I think that's the rationale for the assignment. Uh, I don't know if you want to succeed, um, but I talked to her about it. She has been pretty adamant about that. In regards to the other two, I, I think all of the liaison appointments have value. Um, and and I, that's why we need to have it. Some may be more active than others. <coughs> but I think it, in terms of understanding where the creek is going, the, the, the creek is going, there is value, especially in the here in the city of East Palo to be able to improve if that's necessary because there's still danger over um, 
rising um, flow waters came down to the on the west side of the that whole, that whole area is, is built. And you live on that side, so it just makes sense for me uh, as the presiding director this year to, to really to get you involved in that particular area. I'd like to make a motion uh, to reassign the Chuck to the Finance Committee and myself to District 4 for the County of San Mateo. Well, we got two. No, Chuck is on the I'll second the motion. Okay. So, so, okay. Uh, call for the question. Just a point of order. You can't call for the question. I mean, that, that, that requires a motion to close it. Discussion. Okay. Well, I plan to, so for which position, Bob? Do you want not to be on the plan? Do you need to know? It's up to the two of you. No, you can make the motion in order to we'll vote on it and see if, if that's an acceptable uh, choice for us to change. Robert suggested perhaps there would be some horse trading uh, you know, to, to satisfy the assignments of people that uh, are interested in. So perhaps we should give that an opportunity to have a uh, you know, try to rearrange the seats. I, I, I would you know, you know, suggest that we engage in that process before we uh, you know, try to force something.
think that was not a good idea. I'm talking about the, the chairmanship was held by two people. Um, and I, I think the last year also, uh, the board president served as the liaison to every organization. I think that was problematic. I, it just seems to me that these responsibilities ought to be spread around. And um, what you uh, uh, let me, I get you finish one of the you got two, three minutes. The, um, frankly, there has, this meeting has frequently resulted in changes in community's assignments. It's not unusual that that happened. It may not have happened the year that you joined the board, but it has happened. So I think the, I think the uh, board will function better uh, with some continuity in this. I would recommend, so who takes whose position, it seems to me, Robert, that you have more than enough to do as board president. There's no particular reason for you to serve on finance committee. And I think in a way it's a conflict of interest because we want a system where there's checks and balances. <coughs> and to have somebody who's the board president, it would be nice to have a check on that from, say, the finance committee. Well, I'll give an example. I think um, I think it would have served us well if we had that check and balance uh, in some other areas. And I, I, that's why I'm going to go to the board to make the changes that are on the table right now. Chuck, so, uh, you know, you've been in finance for almost four years. I think most of the time you right, right. So, I know you were last year, the year before the No, I was the chair last year. Last year, you used to before that in the president of the years. Uh, the finance committee. So, so I'm trying to understand the, the rationale. So you've never been the chair of the finance committee. One time. So, so you haven't had your opportunity in that glory, that opportunity. Um, I'm not sure why you want to do that. If I decide that I want to be the chair of the emergency prep, would that create a conflict? Because it's all about it's, it's all about what you will to serve. You will to obviously not saying you don't want to serve, or you want to pick and choose what you want to do uh, on the board. And sometimes these my decisions are based upon the rationale. And that rationale is having Virginia as chair of uh, the finance committee and myself sit on the finance committee. I'm not the chair of the finance committee. You look at it here, it's Virginia uh, is the chair of the finance committee. I'm not sure what I have to I have to give up my seat as board president uh, for you, who's already served on, on that committee. So I'm not, I, I still don't see it. Yes. Okay, well, I can see that myself and Chuck are the only two people that only have uh, one committee assignment. And last year, I was, and Chuck was the same way. So. Uh, we have the other board members that have, have two assignments relative to the other committee assignments. And last year, Chuck and I only had one. There is a motion in a second. 
And if there's no further discussion, then the next step is to take a vote. Yes. Right. What's your question? What's the question? Well, I know that I think Virginia went through it properly, but I would like you to go through both motions and tell us actually what's transpired. So, Director Crawley made a motion to accept the committee liaison assignments for 2020 as they as they appear in your packet as attachment A, and Director Jones seconded that, and that's it. Not to accept, to approve. To to approve. Except approve, yeah. Under consent? Yeah. I uh, spoke to Michelle and she went, thank you for charting this out. For yeah, no great. problem. Uh, talks about Atherton, where it looks like it's on a Wednesday anyway. Uh, Menlo Park is the second and fourth Tuesdays of each month, but as noted, uh, a lot of times they have special meetings and all within our meeting. Uh, in fact, the one time was the changing of the mayor, vice mayor, and the other time was the state of the city, where we, we missed those two. And they were, were not on the reported uh, meeting days. East Palo Alto, one, and of course, the county of San Mateo does meet on Tuesday, but it's in the AM. Correct. Right. So, uh, there is some type of uh, flip-flop because of the, the special meetings that could be called and some of those things that we want to uh, 
me with that. So, I mean, we can keep it the way it is, where we just meet on, meet on the third Tuesday, but as what Michelle told me, there's a lot of variation relative to the special meetings that happen. So, I think we can keep what we have now and uh, kind of cross our fingers and see if we don't have any conflicts or try to attend the meetings. If it's that critical of a meeting, then we can work to decide to the students ask that they the head to do that particular meeting. Director Jones, I, didn't, I don't know if you just said this because my hearing is just not good, oh. but there's also the opportunity, like we can always change, the board could change the day of the regularly scheduled meeting. meeting. If there's something, yeah, of our meeting, if there's something that every you would like to attend, that's on, on the, actually, scheduled on the same day. That's actually a better idea. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so do we need to make a motion on this? It could be just upon consensus. If you're all in agreement, I'll note that and we're good. Okay, that's fine. Great. Okay. How's that? Thanks. Perfect. Move on to item number eight. Item number eight. Uh, discuss and approve uh, community outreach by having a bar for meeting addition bar stations. So I think Harold yeah, I'd happy to go through it. So just, you know, very quickly, I mean, as we're doing with this meeting, and uh, per my discussions with, you know, Director Jones, President Jones on this, you know, it was one of those, well, why stop just in East Palo Alto? Why not, you know, do the road show for part of the year so that we're reaching out to the different uh, areas of the community that, you know, very rarely do you ever see this. In fact, I can't remember this type of an outreach done by the district low on other jurisdictions where you're moving around from place to place so that everybody has an opportunity, you know, as well as it can be done, to come to a meeting and, and be able to address the board. So initially I had put Atherton in third position, meaning that it would be in March, but given everything that's going on with Atherton, uh, we moved it up to February based upon the most recent discussions that they had in which they said they were going to reach out to the community and ask for feedback regarding fire services. It kind of struck me as odd since you're the fire board, maybe people want to talk to the actual fire board that runs fire services. So we moved that up to the second position there uh, after East Palo Alto at Station 3. We would do a similar setup like this. And Michelle and I have talked about if we're going to do that, bringing in more of a professional company to do the video and audio just so that we do a better job of capturing that. But in total, um, you know, again, Atherton would be in February, March would be at Station 77 in Bellhaven to talk about issues that are relevant to Bellhaven. April would be unincorporated county area, specifically Station 4, where we're getting ready to build the fire station up there. As you know, we have uh, a number of things we have to talk about in all these different areas. May, move it over to uh, North Barrow, Station 5, and then finally in June, before bringing it back in July to Station 1, would be to have it in downtown Menlo Park. And in each one of these, you know, there's a lot that can be discussed, there's a lot of things that are going on. You know, when I look at, for example, Bellhaven and Station 77, we have the potential purchase of land from the city of Menlo Park. Uh, we'll call Station 88. We have, I know that I was just approached by uh, Facebook regarding the Bellhaven Community Center and Library they're proposing. I'm, I'm not sure what that meeting's about, but you know, one of the things the board could do to help expedite that is we could waive fees and other things that would make that more of a, a glide path for success. You got the Dunbar Rail Project, you have a Rescue 77, you got the Second Battalion, you got the house that we own there, you know, the property is still leased from the city when it comes to Station 77. So if you were to go through each one of these, there would be a laundry list of things that could be discussed and to hear from the community on as well with the different facilities. And what better place to have those discussions, as I mentioned, you know, again, I don't know how many people in Africa know what's going on with fire services, but 
We have one fire station in Appleton, so many people would want to come by and, and share their thoughts on whether they thought that was a good idea or a bad idea, but at the very least, the fire board should be able to hear from the community as an example versus the community being asked to go to a city council meeting that has no you know, oversight over fire services. So, I mean, it seemed to be timely to do that just by circumstance, but again, I could give you a list on every one of these. I, I just looked up that Director Bernstein is uh, the liaison in Melville Park. I did not look up what Atherton or East Palo Alto are doing, but I think Melville Park is the first to have their goal setting coming up. So, you know, one of the things that we could do too is in goal setting, which we've kind of missed the window for before with the different jurisdictions, is what are our issues. And if you adopt this, you know, then they can also know at a council level this is what we're doing ahead of time. So there's more coordination, collaboration. I think to Director Solano's earlier point about the meeting dates, you know, maybe maybe the councils wouldn't make meeting dates on the third Tuesday of the month because they knew it was a board meeting date and you guys couldn't make that, there would be a conflict. So, you know, kind of both sides of the circle here, meaning, you know, if, if it's if the board is more engaged, the board is more involved, then equally I think maybe the cities would respect that. And obviously you have a representative from the city of Memo Park tonight, so that's already a big a big change there. So, uh, I'm going to have a comment. Oh, oh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, move forward with, with the schedule that the chief has drawn up. For the okay. Okay. Uh, so, That's a good. That's a good question. Some, <laughs> some better than others. Meaning, classrooms or conference rooms, but they're not all set up that way. However, there's ways I think we could work around that too. So. Yeah, you have the day rooms. I mean, you have the kitchen area. So it depends. You know, we have to work that out with the fire crews. The other question is more environmental. Do do, do they have heating or air conditioning such that we can? There as well. Yeah, every one of the stations has in the, in the apparatus room heating because that's kind of what we're dealing with. I think by the time we get into June, I'm not too worried about it being a, an air conditioning situation. But, you know, I think our biggest challenge, Michelle and I discussed this prior to coming here, was going to be how do we record, how do we videotape, and how good a quality that is that going to be? In talking to Jim Lewis, who knows a lot more about that because of his affiliation with, you know, broadcasting and, and so forth, uh, we, we're looking into how we can better do that so that the mic <coughs> in the front and then the videotape is pretty much, you know, the generic videotape. But that's our biggest single challenge. Outside of, it is, it's more work for staff and, you know, it's, to some extent it's, it's some work for you as board members too. And there's parking and different things that, you know, can be somewhat challenging, but again, you got to weigh that against you're taking the, the message on the road, so. I, I, I was going to say, I think there's one other thing. I, I think it would be, I, I misheard a couple of things tonight. It would be helpful to have some sort of public address system that could be very inexpensive, but I think we need to have microphones and mics up. speakers. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And remember, this is kind of the biggest apparatus room that we have. So the others get smaller as well. Yeah, so Carol, um, well, first of all, I'm glad that we're doing this. This is something that, as you know, I've wanted to do for a while. So, Robert, thank you for being able to find that. Um, so, for the station numbers, Carol, we have, I think, I'm assuming that this is just based on the cities that they're in, although, uh, or are you looking at, or, I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at the labels because I think it's important, and maybe in the next report, you might want to kind of mention the areas that these stations serve because, like, I'm I think that in station four, for example, which is in my area of the right. fire district, it serves Atherton, West Atherton, right? Um, the same with um, station five, it serves um, that area near the uh, just, kind of just just around the, um, the Atherton Redwood City border. 
say that it's patient six, right? Um, it's well, I, tried to go, I tried to be simple, but knowing that every one of yeah. these facilities, we have the actual areas and percentages yeah. that they serve in each one of the communities. So, for example, when you talk about Appleton, Station three is the only one in Appleton, yeah. but there's five yeah. total stations. Yeah, so that. I know, and I, that's what I think that, you, I, I, that's what I thought that you did. But I just, I think that it would be helpful for us and for any members of the public who are looking at the um, address or the location of the stations, and it's obviously we have to put the address on there. Yes. So it would be good to know that, you know, the areas that they immediately serve. I mean, I was just at Boston Beach School District, for example, and it's an average, but it's like right on the border, right? So that serves, that station not only serves the unincorporated area of Menlo Park, Sharon Heights, even here in um, Stanford Hills, but it serves average in that unincorporated area of Redwood City, just south of Woodside Road. So it's a huge area. So I just, I just think that that would also help people see that, you know, to how big our fire district is and um, how many areas overlap with the fire stations that are in the locations that they are in. Well, and it's a good point. I mean, again, I'm not married to the order either. Yeah. I, I, just, I just try I just, to make it simple yeah. for the agenda yeah. purposes. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things that I planned to do was, in every one of these, do a quick, I mean, tonight was a different scenario based upon, you know, Director Johns and this being, you know, the city that he lives in, and certainly, the, you know, again, notability of 104 years and, and, and that whole issue. But, to that extent, you know, we did do a presentation after years yeah. ago that is, you know, walk through how it all works, because a lot of people don't know how our system works at all. So I'm happy to duplicate portions of that in every one of these jurisdictions, every one of these communities, because, you know, let me just say this. We're a fire district. So in the end, we were created before any of these other entities existed. I think people forget that. And so, you know, there's a concern about, obviously, fire and emergency response. When the district was built, the district did not acknowledge or look at the city boundaries, or right? it looked at the district. And I mean, that's one of the hard things that people, when they look at things, don't necessarily get to your point, which is our stations cover multiple areas, multiple communities, because they don't acknowledge or separate or have any bias about what their response area is are. And I think that's where you're going with this. And I think showing that is important. They're strategically laid out based upon the best service to the community, whichever community it is. And I, and I think people don't know that, and they don't know how our system works. And why that's important is, anytime you start to play or mess with any part of our system, you're gonna impact and hurt other parts of our system. And I think people don't see that, know that, and understand how that, you know, the fabric of all that, how it was laid out today, is based upon what goes back over you know, 100 years ago. And I think that, that it, it also, I think, is process will lead itself to what someone was talking about earlier in terms of getting a message out there in a target way to a particular area that we uh, are going into. So we can combine the two from how we can get, uh, get our message out there who we are. Well, I think for clarification, too, because I know, you know, even tonight I heard that one of the things we were going to be discussing or was going to be discussed was how we're going to build another fire station in East Palo Alto. I, I don't know where that came from, but that's absolutely, if we have our work cut out with just the ones that we need to rebuild and do, you know, in other parts of the district, but, you know, I was surprised by that. So I think also it's where if people have those concerns, issues, comments, whatever they think is going on, you know, it's helpful to have them then ask those or at least we can say, that's not in the card. So, I, you know, unless, unless I don't know something, I don't know that we plan to build another fire station in East Palo Alto. We are looking at a different location in Memo Park, which I think would improve service to East Palo Alto Memo, and Memo Park, and specifically Bellhaven. But, you know, there's no other plans to build another fire facility, fire station in East Palo Alto. Just to, the Chiefs could advertise where they're going to be. Absolutely. Right, so, I mean, we're good. Yeah, I think the address. Mm -hmm. yes. okay, I mean, that's the one page that you want to address. So, if you approve this, we would put it up on where we're going next, and we do it early on next door, 
through the CERT groups, you know, and do more outreach to the newspapers and all the folks that will cover that. And again, I think it's notable just taking it on the road. It's never been done before. So, thank you, Rose. Right. So, okay. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, to be to second uh, any other comments. There are any call for vote. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 So, directors, obviously, you know, as mentioned uh, in the report, uh, Terry Black and Associates have been actively working on uh, the candidate search, and they received a total of 39 applicants. Uh, I have a conference call with them later on in the week and with uh, Brennan and Human Resources to talk about uh, their preliminary vetting system. Obviously, 39 is a large number, which is good. I thought it would be more, uh, less than that. Uh, two other people, including Brennan, thought it would be more than that. but. I think 39 is a good group. Obviously, I don't know all of the people that are in there. We did have four internal individuals uh, put their names in. Uh, in terms of next steps, which is something that you need to discuss as well, um, yeah, I know Director Solano and others have expressed that they would like to see the board be more involved in the deputy chief's position search and uh, final process simply because, um, you know, that person will more than likely be the next fire chief. That said, one of the things I talked to Director Jones about that last night in discussions with Director Bernstein was maybe having the president in the final panel with myself, or I will add this, which is not uh, on here, Director Bernstein presented to me a process that he's used before where the board as its own panel gives recommendations to the fire chief meaning that then you also can look at the candidate and make a recommendation based upon who you see. You know, I understand the appetite of, of again, I'm not going to be here forever because there's truth in that. Um, I'm, I'm approaching the end of my time here. Um, so realistically, there will be a new chief. Whether or not it will be this deputy chief, that would be, I think, something to consider. I mean, obviously that person does the day-to-day. -day. That said, I know you also have a desire that whoever that would be could step into my shoes if I wasn't there or if I left or uh, retired. So, you know, I think it does make some sense. I just don't know, again, what format you would like that in. So I think that's probably the discussion you all need to have. I want to hear from the shop here, close to us. Let's see what the shop is there. The recreation needs to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I was trying to make it clear, and I think I think it's been the consensus of the board that board members don't believe that they should be making this decision of who the deputy chief is. But I was talking to them in our organization. We have we have five different schools or child care centers. Each one has a director. We involve the staff as on one interview panel, and they interview. The parents are on another interview panel. And we make it clear to people that none of them are decision makers. We don't even allow them to rank the candidates. They might interview three to five people, and they put comments about each person, but they're just observations. They're not, oh, this is the best, this is my number one. We try to get rid of all that. So they're not making the recommendation of who should be hired. They're just making observations. And it's been our experience that I could interview someone and they interact with me a certain way. But when they talk to the staff, they might be different than that. And I'd like to hear from the staff what, what they have to say about that. Similarly with parents. Sometimes people just don't. Parents will ask a question. And all of these groups have to work with whoever is the final candidate. But ultimately, the, select, the selection is made by one person. And again, I don't think there's any dispute here that the fire chief should be making that. I just think he would benefit from having more input from people. And what I found, off, I mean, I'm the one who actually hires the, the directors in the end, but I'll get comments from some parents or, or, or some staff, and I'll say, oh, that's really interesting. I don't know, I'm going to follow that up. And then when I meet subsequently with the candidate, I say, 
you know, a couple people thought this. Can you tell me why they might have had that impression? What does that mean to whatever? And a lot, it gives me more input. But again, it's not to usurp the power of the chief to make the final decision. So, so the chief, in terms of the outline and you envision what that process is beyond the paper screen. Well, can I just add one thing? Harold, you actually have on here this recommendation that the board president or his designee accompany you in the final interview with each candidate. Yeah, I could, I could, for whatever, however it goes through the panel. But I think, you know, one of the things in talking to Director Bernstein last night, I think it, it actually addresses the board's concern. Because, look, at the end, I get the reality. What do you think is the board's concern? Having some input as to the, who the candidate would be for the next deputy chief. Because, realistically, that could be your next fire chief. That hasn't happened in a while. It, well, it hasn't happened. I mean... Look, I I'm, but, to but to be fair, but to be fair, when I was made fire chief in 2007, we had not had an internal candidate be the fire chief in 21 years. So you didn't have that process. I mean, I, I think what Director Bernstein is proposing, which when he when he we discussed it last night, I think that satisfies you know the desire of the board to have some input because. You know, I was resistive at first because I see this as the day-to-day, -day, and obviously that's really important to me, right? But to be fair, I mean, look, I'm not, I got hurt once. I know how that works. And you know, that's a surprise. Nobody wants a surprise. We didn't have a deputy chief at the time. So there's always that reality, okay? The second part of this is I get what the board wants. I mean, a nice, smooth, clean succession with people who know what's coming is not disruptive to the organization. And so, you know, that part of me also says that would be the ideal circumstance for the organization because if you have to do the do-over to find a fire chief, like many have had to do, you know, get the checkbook out, pay $100,000, do the nationwide search, and then I don't know what you're going to come up with. So I think this is a better way in many ways to do it. If you could, we've watched, I've watched three organizations in the county promote from within. I don't know exactly how that path went. Again, I wasn't exactly, not, sorry to tell you, but I wasn't exactly the guy convinced to be in the fire chief when I was convinced that to move up. For a lot of different reasons. I had my dream job and so forth. And I'm not saying it wasn't a good fit. I would, I would say to you, it had been so long since that happened that it wasn't, it wasn't a natural thing. I think even if we end up with someone coming into the organization from the outside, and that's an if, the reality is at least that person will have a period of time to adjust the organization and the organization adjust to the person. And having that, having an interview with the board, again, I think in the procedures that Director Bernstein laid out, which was intriguing, I think is a good way to have at least that feedback from the board to, you know, a vet a candidate, looking at that person from your standpoint, which is fair. I mean, we're all scattered. Kind of the panel's going to look at it from their standpoint, which is, hey, we're looking for the person that's going to be our day-to-day -day boss on the daily operations of the jurisdiction. Well, yeah. uh, I had mentioned this before in our last meeting when I was talking about a, a selection panel. And, you know, I think we should. And what's the current panel chief that you have for selection? Panel? So I haven't, I don't pick that. Basically, it's. Well, who's your panel before you make a pick? So, in the past, how this has worked, they'll have labor, a representative from labor, they'll have chief officers from a different organization, and then some other, maybe even retired personnel that come back. You know, mostly all fire service, um, and like I said, someone from, someone from labor. That's, that's what occurred last time. Okay, because what I would like to do, since we do serve, well, four communities, the county, of course, three cities, one town, two cities, excuse me. I would like to have one of those council members or a town or city or county manager to sit on that. A community member, may he or she own a dry cleaner, a restaurant, something like that. Uh, two fire board members, a union rep, and to the discretion of the chief to pick one of his staff people. Oh. I mean, and 
And, and look further is the, is the reason why I want to do this is that, you know, since we do serve the community, we, we want to get a business or community member involved. Since we deal with the city and county councils, we want to get that, them involved. And of course, the two board members, you know, the ultimate selection, I feel, should be the chief and should be set aside relative to your chief's interview, what you want to call it. But I just would like to get the community more involved. And of course, using the union rep uh, to have either 2400 or, you know, have a representative there, but it's, it's not like they're making the hiring decision, but they're part of the process, and I think that's important for the community to be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is, uh, if time permits, uh, I think uh, for both Chuck and, and Rob, you know, for almost my day, is to be referred to the HR committee. I was just <laughs> For consideration, I'd like to get input from Brenna, uh, you know, what are the pros and cons of each approach, and, and maybe some approaches we haven't considered. Uh, again, I don't know what, what kind of time constraints we're dealing with. Chief, yeah, do, you, do you know what, if, uh, what, what, what kind of schedule are we on? So right now, like I mentioned, with the 39 candidates, Terry Black, they're vetting, so they're doing that internal mm -hmm. reduction on the list based on qualifications and other things that they'll see. They'll push out a list then that will go to a panel, which has been the traditional way to do it. I don't know when Brenda was going to set that up and when that was going to occur. I know it's it's not going to be too far past the end of February to try and get through the whole process because initially it's goal is March. So Again, this is this is so important to us. If we had to do a special meeting meeting on Set up the panel interviews, including the chief's interview, 
which would occur in February, and then by March you'd have your final candidate work out whatever arrangements there in terms of, you know, if they're currently employed, leaving that employer, moving to the Bay Area, if they have to move, or if it's an internal candidate, making that announcement, which would be quicker, and addressing whatever vacancy that would create as well. So, Chief, Chief I'm curious, uh, out of the 39 applicants, uh, they'll be pared down or shortlisted to have I don't know. I think I think they're gonna. You know, my my discussion with Brenna was I would prefer to see more than less. Part of that, thing, it's funny because I get this with the firefighter candidates too. It's is if you know they try and make it almost too tight sometimes. Where you know I like having more people. I'd rather see more people than less. So unless there's a real compelling reason that somebody again, under it's no yeah, I mean, you know, does it hurt to spend another day on the internet? No, it doesn't hurt. You know, but some people, for whatever reason, they think they don't like doing that. I don't mind doing that. I'd rather see more people have a broader selection base that way, which also means down in the panels, there's going to be more people coming through. Okay. You know? More, more is better these days, so. Uh, I don't know. It sounds like it. Does everyone agree that it goes to uh, this group referred to the HR Commission? Sure. Okay. So do we, we need to vote for that? Is this um, the HR Yeah, we need to write you to the HR Commission. Sure. Yeah, Who's changing? Jim Chip, okay. So. All right. So as soon as I know, you'll know. You'll know. Yeah. Chief, I was curious. Um, I'm sure you didn't have to do this, but I was just curious. I read through the job description. At what point do we do like a background check, a criminal record check, and those kinds of things? So typically the way that works is you have to offer somebody the job these days, which I'm not a big fan of, but that's the rule. And so, you know, you do that, and then because you're literally on the hook, so to speak, you can do background screen. Uh, for this position, I'm not as concerned for that, but I am, you know, on entry level, it's, it's a burden to do that. So the rules have changed. I used to be able to background a whole bunch of people. We'd, we'd sort them out, and then we'd end up doing job offerings to the ones that didn't, didn't wash out. Now it's the other way. You've got to offer them the job first, and then if you find out that it's not going to work out, you, you kind of can cripple yourself depending upon, you know, the size and number of candidates that you have. And that's, I'm probably going to give you some news soon on that that I am finding out about too, so not to go there yet, but. Yeah. Okay. I think that would be at the margin of this. Yeah. As soon as I know, you'll know. Next, next day or two. All right. Uh, thank you very much. So we're moving on to number 10, which is uh, discuss uh, uh, and adopt a resolution approving the letter of intent to purchase one Rosenbar International MX uh, M91X electric flower vehicle with a down payment not to exceed $1,000 if you want a 10 free production spot for so I actually removed, removed the approve in here after discussions with Director Jones, who I know, uh, and the report states, I mean, the president called me and it was Director Solano talked to the president of Rosenbauer USA as well. There's still a slot. I mean, this is just to have, I think, a follow-up discussion. It doesn't mean you're forced to do anything. There is a, a period of time that Director Jones talked to, to the president, John, as well. Um, and that's when Director Jones and I discussed, should we just put it on the agenda and then you know, have a path forward if there's a path forward. You know, and again, I, I took the approval off this just because I didn't want the board to feel as if tonight is yet another one of those, if you don't do something, you're, gonna, you're going to uh, miss an opportunity, but you can discuss it, you can not discuss it, you can move it. I mean, there is a window of time still for this apparently. I don't know how long, but it sounds like it was longer than you were led to believe by one of the salespeople. Um, the president of the company doesn't clearly feel that way, but also says there is a limited amount of time. He can't hold the spot forever. So whatever the whatever the desire of the board is, it's, it's obviously. Up to you. 
So any comments or questions on the board? Mm -hmm.
Um, I think that we should absolutely jump in. And I'm glad that, you know, Robert, that you and Harold were trying to talk this through. I'm assuming you talked to Rosenbauer, the CEO. Well, yeah, I want to give Director Solano actually called Rosenbauer, and then the president called me, and then I told uh, Director Jones, you know, you should probably call Rosenbauer just because, as far as I was concerned, I hadn't, I wasn't going to address this at all, right? We left this, we're moving on for now. And I ended up talking to President Jones about electric vehicles and what would be the way forward from a policy standpoint. It was a good point that we don't have any more. Uh, any of those vehicles, and we had a Prius at one time, that wasn't exactly the, the, the way forward there. But I think, you know, there's a bigger discussion around some of the other topics, whether this is the one you want now, or, you know, that's, it's well, that's totally your call, and the, the, the deal is sitting there still, according to the President of Rosenbauer, unlike what you were told that night by one of the salespersons. And, and again, so coming from him, it sounds like there's still an opportunity. So Director Jones and I talked about it. it's why it's on the agenda. Uh, it's the same deal points as far as I'm aware of, and I think that's, you know, that's what's on the table. Well, I, I'm glad that it's back on the agenda, and I think if it's the same risk-free um, situation, I'm glad that we have a second chance to do this. And, you know, just to be clear, though, it does come with work. Oh, yeah, right? no, I know, because but I mean, in terms of... People have to be, it's got to be discussed. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Right. It's just a foregone conclusion. No, no, so, I know. If it, it's the due diligence period and it's correct. the refundable deposit that to me makes the most sense for us to, to move forward with it. Thanks for bringing this back on. You know, I express my opposition to uh, this is the last meeting. And since that time, I've gotten an education about the process that the district uses in selecting apparatus and, and design. And it's a far more involved uh, and intricate process than, than I appreciated uh, in the past. Uh, I think this is something that is uh, it, it's critical to the mission, you know, the, the selection of this equipment, uh, you know, being able to uh, be involved in the design process and, specifications and whatnot uh, for the equipment that we have now you can see the value to the, to the district and I, I think it's something that we have to tread very lightly in, in altering that that process by adapting or considering you know a, a vehicle that is still very much in the concept phase it doesn't exist there's no track record for it there's no uh, no reliability performance data that we can consider uh, in, in making a, uh, uh, this choice. The, the cost issue is still a great concern to me. It's, it's many times more expensive than the vehicle that it would be replacing. Uh, so I think for, for me again, the, I, I don't think I'm being clairvoyant when I say the future probably holds electric fire trucks. You know, the, the district does have a, a great reputation for being uh, uh, innovators and uh, people have earned reputation. But that doesn't always mean that you have to go first. And uh, again, I come back to the same place that it, when I look at the cost, when I look at uh, the, the, the vehicle selection, the apparatus selection process that we have in place now, it's, it's has served us well, and I think if we, before we alter that, it needs to be done very carefully, with great consideration. Uh, and I don't think I don't think that has happened. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I don't think we miss any opportunities if, if we don't go first. If uh, if we're not in that first wave that, uh, that uh, purchases a uh, a truck, and I appreciate that we're just buying time. 90 day period, but the, the elements that I'm describing, I, I don't think uh, they have a much longer time frame involved than 90 days. So, for all those reasons, I think it's a focus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harold, do you have Pretty much the same reasons that I had uh, in December, I pretty much have now. Uh, what we're looking at is 
something that we need to, as she said, get involved with a lot of time. Uh, the apparatus committee uh, have written up some individual evaluations of uh, their members, and uh, it looks like we have peers, and you know, maybe a three to five year junction to come back and review this. When I spoke to the CEO, he said that they were down in Los Angeles County and they, and they were looking at the vehicle. So, you know, that might be something too that, that we need to obtain some information from them if they do go forward with it. But at this juncture, I, I just can't see spending that much money for the $1.2 million uh, for uh, a rescue vehicle. That's enough. And I value what our firefighters, since they have to use the equipment, drive the equipment, put the equipment, save lives and save your own lives, uh, I have to go with their recommendation. Thank you. I think this whole discussion has been very valuable for me because I didn't really appreciate fully how difficult this whole thing is and how many issues there are. Uh, and it's generated a lot of paperwork and reviews of things, listening to what uh, Ruth Torres uh, had to say about it was interesting. I was shocked at the amount of downtime with uh, the Pierce equipment, look at the ladder being down 260 days or something like that. I mean, this is horrendous. And it's something that I think the board needs to get involved in. And I, I thought it was going to be a long time before I would go to spend another two to three million dollars on Pierce equipment, given what's, what's happened, what I discovered. Um, so I think that's a problem. But let me say, I, I don't think this, this proposal is risk-free. And the reason I don't think it's risk-free is I think, I think the, the firefighters could sink it. If they don't feel part of it, if it's something they don't want, I think behaviorally we're, we're risking uh, the failure of the test. And this is, a, this, is a, this is something I'm interested in. I'd like to see us move to different powertrains. I'd like to see us um, experiment with this. But there's no experiment built in. This is, it, it's a $1.1 million piece of equipment which is 15 times the $75,000 price of the rescue. And yet there's no experiment to try it as a fire engine. And it seems to me I'd like to see a plan that the firefighters would buy into and say, well, for a year we'll use it for a rescue. And then after one year we'll use it as a fire engine. And, and, and when we actually, when we got all done, we know what we had and whether it was worth going forward or not. I don't see that support yet. I mean, it could be there, but I think I think somebody's got to sell it within within the ranks, and I don't think I don't think it's been sold yet. And I, I think the risk is if we get this thing and we sort of shove it down their throat and they reject it and sits out on the back lot, in the end we fail. And I, so that's where I think we've taken a risk that wasn't worth doing. So I, I, I wish we could do something more with this, but I, I, I just feel it's irresponsible at this point to use it as a rescue when we've got a perfectly good rescue, it's brand new. Um, I just don't, in, unless they would get on board, um, I, I just don't see how this is going to be a successful experiment. What is getting on for you in terms of making reference, are you talking about the our fighters or our athletics committee or who is they? Well, I, I think, I, I, I guess I'm saying I'm, I'm confounding both of those things. I, I think maybe the apparatus committee would have to buy into it. They'd have to turn, sell it to, to some station that would say, yes, we're going to try it. We think this is a good idea. We're, we want to embrace this. And we're, they, they at least have a stake in making it a successful thing. And I think there's more information we need, by the way. So part of it is the is the is the truck, or the, that's the truck, the fire engine, the rescue. Part of it is our electric infrastructure. 
could support it or support it in part. I just don't, I don't feel like we've really bought into the whole thing yet. And we're making the argument for firefighter health. And yet, I don't see them being really committed to it. They're, they're seeing it from the other side. Yeah, what if it fails? What if, what if it doesn't do what we need? We're endangering our, our health that way. And I, I'm not sure where, where this all falls out of the end. Trying to protect somebody who doesn't think that it's a protection, I, I think that's a potential problem. No, I mean, I think, that, you know, the, the points are all well taken. I mean, having watched kind of the media and, and just people spun up on the different articles, you know, it's funny because it's either people really like this idea or they hate it, right? They think it's a waste of money. It's not, you know, it's not the future. You know, they, they have the, the virtues of why it would fail, similar to what happened with Fremont TD, notwithstanding that that was actually an error by the people using the vehicle. But, you know, to Director Bernstein's point, you know, there's also, there is, I don't know so much about the firefighters as much as it's new. It's different. It's not anything we have. Um, there's a lot of questions. You know, we could try and solve <coughs> all of those. That's what the whole 90 day period was for more discussion and, and investigation. But all that said, like I said, there are, there's a lot of work in all that. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's not like if you said yes, it would be so easy, and at the end of it, there's a purchase. There's oh, a lot I never more work. That, there's a purchase. Right. There's a lot more work that needs to get done. So, you know, I, I would just like to say, you know, I, I've, I've expressed my thoughts on uh, on the fire truck, but I, I would like to see us move forward with uh, considering perhaps bringing Teslas in the fleet. You know, one or two. I, I would still like to see us pursue the solar panels for the station roof. I think there's a lot of advantages and benefits there. We talked about some of it just having a, a redundant power source. Power uh, I, I think that would have great advantages. So I think there are some, some proven known technologies, uh, green technologies that could be employed very, very well today. I, I um, contacted the uh, Dan uh, Presley, who's in charge of public safety vehicles in Tesla. And they'd be willing to get with the chief and his staff. Uh, as he said, they're about five years out by the time they would even consider large type electric vehicles. But they have worked with Fremont PD.
I suspect, and I said this last time and people laughed at me, but I think if we came back to this in six months or a year and had our money ready, that they'd make 11 of them rather than 10 of them and we can get one. So I, I, I don't feel like this is the last word on it by any means. And uh, every time a salesman wants to rush me, I just say, oh, that's the time to take a little bit more time. And, uh, so I, I'm hoping that we do spend the next three to six months looking at these kinds of things. Well, I think, you know, again, you have the February 4th meeting coming up, and we'll, yeah, we'll try and tighten up the parameters for that. But those, you know, this is all good dialogue. And when I discussed this with Director Jones, I mean, initially the broader dialogue was a policy statement, looking at the vehicles. I thought those were all good points during the overall discussion. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of work. We have employees that are driving electric vehicles today. I mean, so we don't have plug-ins at all of our facilities. We need to take a, obviously, look at that as we discussed with the solar panels. You know, we had that discussion with us, the power wall, generators, and the whole different thing with the PSPF, public safety power shutoff by PGE. So, again, part of your planning meeting coming up will have to be where does this rank? How much time do you want to spend? And what direction do you want staff to take to look at it? So, you know, I think it's worth it. I'm, I'm happy we had another discussion tonight, at least about all that. But for now, I mean, nothing has changed. So, you know, just where, where we are. I, uh, I would like to, maybe it's because it sounds like the reports are not here and not forward with this particular proposal, that I, I would like to, uh, for to consider referring this item and I'm trying to find what this item is. Referring this item over to uh, the planning uh, committee to for further look, see, and look at to flush out. I know uh, to develop a policy statement around the electric vehicle use, future use for the district, and with the idea of what that would look like, uh, so that it can bring that back to the board so we can begin to kind of. On a broader perspective, broader pictures, to be able to kind of understand what what our future will look like, what our vehicle future will look like here in the district, and begin to look for that. Uh, so, yes. I, I think that's a great idea, and I think you and the vice president. that we should have a policy on this. So, and it, it, and it fits within the strategic planning area because it's part, I would be part of the vision of what we need in the fire district. So I it's think it's great. Well, it's more than quick. It's, it's a philosophy, right? It's a philosophy of, you know, how to, how to uh, incorporate clean vehicles, for not just environmental, but you know, firefighters' health, their health, I mean, it just, there's, it's not just equipment. To me, the equipment part is operational. This is a philosophy that I think that we as board members and policy makers need to discuss and probably need to be more strategic. So I definitely concur that that's the way to go. So are there any comments, feedback, or any emotion from the board? Well, that was, it, it was just a discussion, so there was no approval. Yeah, so if, it, if the board is okay with
think of rather than that high energy issue. Exactly. It's a philosophical policy. Right. It, 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 it involves our facilities yes. as well as our vehicles. Yeah. That's right. That's right.
but then we didn't necessarily have complete resolution on what the items were. There was two lists. They didn't necessarily all match up. This year, hopefully, we can get through all of that and prioritize what needs to get done or what is desired to be done with realistic you know, time frames and so forth. And then, as I mentioned, one thing I particularly like, and I've, I've told this to Director Jones, I know some people in the audience may or may not like what I'm going to say, but I like what Menlo Park does because at least they have a list and then they read, they work off of the list, not necessarily change it every single year. It's a work plan. So it's more of a living document that then they, the council, have meetings, they can priority, priority things up, down, off, whatever, but there's an existing plan that continues on. And I think that's probably an easier way to work on things without changing it up. So yeah, so let's deal with uh, the, the time slot. Oh, good. Well, I, I wanted to ask about the time slot because it would be helpful to me. It just happens to be that day's slight problem for me. If we could do it a little bit earlier, like you would start at 12 or 1 and not go as late as 6, I don't know how other people are.
Yeah, no, Times, uh, it looks like we got that. I mean, again, I think in the past, too, this has been one where, you know, the board members go back through you as the, as the president and the chair with their items. I mean, so it'd be nice to know if there's outliers, where are they, that the board members see they want to have on the list now. And that all gets input. Okay. <coughs> all right, so we probably set a deadline on that. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of like to do the free flowing. Free flowing is at the, at the meeting, come up with those ideas, and then we facilitate the meeting and work through it. Because all they do is going to not get so that you get some notice of the idea. It's up for us to, as board members, kind of consider it. Or even, even if we just put it up there in a mix of which is a priority, because we've got to prioritize our, our goals and say or else we're going to be chasing and chasing and that kind of thing. So, and the facilitators are here to help us get to that point. So we can bring the items with that to the meeting. So I think we've got a marching on this there. Everybody okay with that? So moving on to uh, agenda item number, the proposed uh, agenda item. Um, and so that I'm clear and everybody's clear, the proposed agenda items are to that uh, the, the board decided that these items to discuss to see if they would be uh, uh, going in future agendas. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to agenda items. Item number 12 is that from uh, Director Blossom, he's going to discuss employees to travel, pay for five vendors. So I'm not sure. Any, any five you know, I think uh, this issue came up with uh, the employees that we had travel at uh, vendor expenses last summer. And, uh, it really matters of expense. I think it's an area. Chief, I, I have a question for you. Do we, uh, on equipment purchases, are, are we following the county uh, procurement rules, or do we follow our own? So we looked at we looked at that. We don't see, other than under, um, I think it was donations, if there's any language that we currently have. And that, they looked at county, they looked at our policies as well. There's no way that there's nothing that governs that. And I know in talking to Director Bernstein yesterday, he also has concerns when this is written into a contract with the trips going back and forth as well that are under the contract. The only thing I would add there, though, is you, know, you have inspection timelines, which would mean somebody's got to go travel regardless. It would just be the district pays for it. So, you know, we have, we have what we do with Rosenbauer, which is different. It's the first time we've done that. Um, but then we also have what we do with other vendors, like we did it with the airboat, we do it with the engines and the truck, is where we send personnel. But that's all covered under your contract. If we don't want that in the contract, we still have to do it. We would just have to bear the expense. So, you know, there's more to think about based upon how you want this to get done. I, I would suppose that this be referred to the strategic plan and the HR. Do not allow any gifts 
over fifty dollars without it being written onto your form seven hundred. There's a number of different rules. Isn't that only for elected officials though? Well, certain designated management positions go on the form seven hundred. So that that should all be part of our discussion. Right. I mean, the point is it's going into the committee. Right. So the committee got their got their direction. Right. Yeah. Um, the other item uh, has to do with uh, from uh, Director McLaughlin again. Discuss uh, when a pension exceeds the amount Calpher Calpher can pay. Uh, what is the obligation of the employee agency and the office of the district? Yeah. I'm sorry, I want to backtrack just a little bit because you actually, Director Jones, started to make a motion to refer the item to the HR committee for the travel paid for by vendors. Did we? He didn't make the motion. He's, he's, I, did you I, make I started to. Okay. You don't have okay, so to yeah, yeah, it. you don't have to. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that. Yeah, we just gave you a charge. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I brought this up in the last meeting without going into too much detail. Really involved. Uh, there are limits to what CalPERS can pay in, in pension benefits, and anything over that becomes an obligation of the employer. Uh, if if we're at that threshold or across that threshold, uh, I think this it, it just seems to be sunshine. It just seems you know, we need to know that the that the district. Started has incurred that expense and just what that expense looks like and projecting into the future. So, again, I think this is an issue that, that should be referred to the HR committee uh, for review to be consideration. I agree But just to add to that, the district gets sent a bill directly by CalPERS for that overage, which circumvents the normal participation part where employees do pay part of their pension, but they don't pay any part of that overage. And I think the whole thing should be discussed and so forth. So the charge for, for the HR community is? Uh, take a, a comprehensive view of, of the issue of uh, CalPERS capped pension benefits. Yeah, which would include checks. We touched on this issue, uh, you know, with, with, with the, the Pierce equipment, uh, and again, I think this calls for a much larger uh, discussion. Uh, what is our current experience? How does it relate to other agencies that use the same equipment? Uh, it, is it possible that uh, we have issues with Pierce, but other manufacturers, there's even more issues? I don't know, but I think. And Chief, I'd be interested in, in knowing what your views on this, what, on, on how to proceed. So step one, you know, we're meeting with the apparatus committee later on this month. Uh, that's followed by meeting with Pierce on some of these issues, because there are issues. Regarding, you know, again, to the engines that are coming up, I know one of the, you know, one of the things that was brought up was the feeling of a pressure because of an increase first of the year that we had to make a move because there's money in the account to purchase three more engines. Well, but that's, you know, again, I'd rather do it right than do it wrong. These visiting other vendors is a real issue because I think having our personnel exposed to what other entities are doing to see how they build their units. We've done two, but as you know, it's a three vendor bid. Um, so I think to the actual specifications, which thus far have been closed, primarily to Pierce, which I know you know, would be the preference for some of the personnel on the apparatus committee. You know, and listening to the board and understanding, you know, the broader concept here, and, and that this is going to be scrutinized to a much uh, larger degree. You know, we're going to go back and have some discussions about specifications and what we need to do going forward to make this more of an equal horse race. I guess is the best way to put it. I guess uh, what I had in mind in proposing this was just making sure that we have a process in place. We're, we're, we're capturing our experience. You know, what is our downtime? What are our expenses? What's our experience in 
in replacing the part of the city and whatnot, maybe you know, any other related issues. It, you're collecting that in a systematic way so that we can we can develop a history. You know, what, what does it look like? And then compare that to again, other agencies and, and, and reach out. So that's what I have in mind with that. I mean, do we have a process in place so that as we make these purchasing decisions, it, it's within yeah, we have a new process in place that we didn't have in place that we still need to make sure we're refining that process. Right now we know what the vendor related downtime is, but there's other downtime if in fact the rig is involved in a vehicle accident, if something is done with the vehicle that, you know, inadvertently something is broken or put in the wrong um, hole, so to speak, and with the depth and so forth that's added for environmental and other reasons. I mean, the two big things that I've seen have changed is the environmental impact. I mean, and that's for it too. I think one of these days, you as the board should probably be exposed to what we need to do on regening an engine. Because they go down for a good 20, 30 minutes. And that's, you know, we're talking about other alternative vehicles. You should see what we have to do because of the California environmental laws, which are across the country now, sadly. But, you know, that's a big deal, and then, you know, equally, um, you know, to the, to the issue of parts, downtime, all those things, we're starting to finally capture some, a lot of, some of that data so we can extrapolate it and understand the next mode. Sure. So, I, I was going to say, I, I think it's another item that should be referred to the strategic planning committees so that we can review the process and get a better understanding. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see any reason why this shouldn't go to the strategic planning committee, but I think I, basically our product consists of three things human resources, facilities, and vehicles. I mean, that, that's the product we offer. And I was going to ask that we have a study session on this because I think the strategic planning committee should discuss it, but I think the whole board needs to understand how it works, um, you know, how is Rosenbauer as somebody that's an original equipment manufacturer type using other people's stuff different from peers, which creates one of a kind pieces for their own equipment. You know, how does that work? What are the costs? What are the, what are the consequences when something goes down? And how much does it cost us to air freight something from wherever they are, as opposed to, you know, going down here in San Jose and picking up the part off the shelf? And I think we need to understand that. I was going to ask for if we could have maybe a, like you know an hour, maybe a two-hour study session. Uh, I'm going to later talk about the facility, but in this case, I'm not the whole idea of apparatus. What? How do we buy that? What are the issues? Because this is where we could make some sort of policy direction. Uh, I think it's interesting to find out, for example, how the, the apparatus committee has designed these compartments to facilitate their their job. I don't quarrel with them at all. I never second guess what, what they think, but I'd like to know what it is and to what extent can we duplicate from one piece of equipment to another piece, from one manufacturer of equipment to another manufacturer. Is that possible? Is it not possible? I, just, I simply don't know. So I, I think we need some education on this. I, I think uh, I think that I think we'll probably need to get some from a clear direction from You know, whether it's far stretch to uh, uh, refer this over to an emergency prep you know. I think strat is where you want to be on this one. Okay. All right. Just because it is the go forward, and I think all those are good, but they're all good questions. And I'll say, you know, the firefighters behalf, standardization is a big deal, especially when you have a lot of new personnel. I mean, being able to go to the compartment, I've worked here in the years with things that are different places on all kinds of different rigs, and so, now, I understand where they're coming from on that because, you know, you'd have to learn it all, not that you couldn't, but, you know, one day if you're at this station versus another station, and even even where things were located, you know, you're, you're right, Director, I mean, you could go to a standard box layout, but you got to be, be able to make sure that can be done, too, because, you know, again, if you go to the compartment and it's got different equipment in it, then where's the equipment you need? So, you know, I hope we don't revisit those days, and I don't think that we will, but those are those are factors on performance, so. All right.
So is the Strategic planning, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, item number six, uh, 15, uh, Director Bernstein uh, discussed district uh, property location at uh, 1487 Chilcoat Street in the park. I think this is a, a two-headed issue, and I'd like to put it on the agenda. Maybe it's two separate agenda items. Uh, the fact is we've done some work on that property that was not authorized by the board, and that needs to be addressed. <clears throat> the second part of this is that um, it involves the issue of housing for staff, and I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed as a board policy also. So I, I would propose that we discuss this one, we've got a specific problem, a specific house with specific amounts of money that we spent outside of budget approval and board approval. And second, we have the issue of are we going to provide housing for staff and how do we do that, what are the terms, and uh, what are the, the risks in terms of, you know, do they then have some sort of leasehold interest? Or, I, I don't know about that, we ought to, we ought to find out. Oh, one of the concerns I have about, uh, I hear you about the money spent, uh, but it, it appeared to me that we didn't have any problem when there was the issue over in Addison came up and they were across to be concerned about all of the, the as they call it, an eyesore taking place, uh, having the chief in front of where you can fix whatever you need to fix. And, and here, the same situation. Make the outside look 
decent so that it doesn't look like a drug house as someone, one of the council members mentioned to too. So I don't see the difference between why Atherton would be um, a priority over Bellhaven when quite frankly Bellhaven is just as important as Atherton. Yeah. I, I think in both cases, uh, complaints were expressed and we responded to them. Well, but, we're, 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 but people on our board are complaining that we responded just to the minimal, let's put a fresh coat of paint on, and let's not do any more work on the yard. So that, that's all I'm saying, that there was complaints from this board about that. So I don't, that is not different from I, what has happened in Atherton. I guess I had a different understanding of the issues that were raised. Uh, again, there was external appearance issues with both the all the draw yes. house and the Choco house. Yes. And they were addressed. I think the key difference, as Chuck points out, is in, with the Chilco house, it went well beyond right. improving the physical appearance of the, the front of the house that created the initial complaint. No, I think you get that. That's not the key. I, I think that's the, 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 the that's beyond, beyond the, the order and uh, I don't see that uh, over on Almodar, if there was other work done over there in that what I'm saying, Robert, is there were complaints even to fix the outside appearance of it. And that is so to say that it's only one thing is disingenuous. I, I understand that. And, and I think I'm, I'm, there is a, there's two parts of what Chuck stated was in the first part had to do with the outside appearance. That's the first part. The second part is that the interior of it is the work with the cost that we're going to do to fix the interior. But it leads into what we sort of talked about earlier in the absence of, of, of a policy. And I think we all acknowledge the fact we don't have a housing policy. We don't know what that was. The chief is the chief plan of what, based on the chief planning on this part in terms of how the station personnel, that that seemed like a logical part. Somewhere we, our ships, our ships passed in the night, and we, we've got to figure out now that it's that has happened, what is looking at the long-term policy we need to have uh, put into place uh, to make that to make that happen. Uh, because there, there, and we do have a need on both both instances that yeah. what are we gonna do with the the Daddy Chief and he's gonna come here, that's not the logical place because of the, the situation where it is, that's no logical place over there. So uh, in Delhi. So in regards of what has been spent, and there may have been uh, going beyond a particular dollar amount we had in mind, uh, and I don't know what that dollar amount is, in the absence of any policy, there was a decision made on it. So we just got to figure out how to fix it. I, I don't think there's an absence of policy. I think we know what we can spend. When we made the repairs on the Omicron house, those were brought to the board. There was a big expenditure to take out the pool, which we a leaky pool, which we felt was a danger to the community in Kingston, and that all came to the board. And we, we, that was brought up at the committee levels, it was discussed by the board, these are repairs, and these are brought beyond repairs. This is a, a rehabilitation of a, of a facility that could be torn down completely okay, if we extend. I don't want to really interrupt at this point, but the point of these particular items, we're supposed to decide, do we want them to go on, on the next agenda? agenda? And you're not surprised right. they're going to be discussed. So, so the question is, Kathy, is that we're great. Uh, if we're going to have further discussion on it, we're going to have that before me. So what are your wishes of the board? I'd like to make a motion that we put on two two items. Um, one is, is the actual what we do with, with Chilco and whether we continue or not continue with, with the improvements. And the second is uh, look at a, a, our, our policy on housing staff. Do we don't have a policy? Do we have a policy? Do we don't have to put on work? So I, I will. Well, we just spent $100,000 to do it without any policy. I'm sorry. That's just not the way the public agency runs. Let me, can I clarify one thing? So there seems to be a little bit of a mix and match, but, and maybe it's, I didn't explain it well enough. 
the, the town chief that will go into service that the board approved is not a division chief or someone that's staying over and doesn't live in the area, which is currently what we're doing for a staff captain, and we have even maybe a, a battalion chief on a special project, or has been done like we've done in the past at the house behind Station 6 before it was torn down. The, the, the Choco House, the way I envisioned it, was going to be for the second battalion chief that you approved that will be 24-7, 365. That's like having battalion one at a station one, this would be that second battalion, which would be central to the three areas, 77, 2, and 5. We have shut down construction and anything to do with rehabilitation of the, of the house on Chilco. There's nothing getting done. You got time. So, you know, at this point, that's where we are. But there is a difference between transitory housing and a 365. 24-7 So. So what is the board? Uh, well, I have a motion. Well, well you it, 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 I yeah. thought that we had two agenda items coming out of this. One, that we look at the Chilcot House and decide what, if anything, we want to do in terms of proceeding or not proceeding. And the second is that we put the idea of staff, that the concept of staff housing on an agenda with an eye toward developing a make policy. I don't understand what the second item, put it on the, on the agenda item to discuss whether we have a policy. It, it, like you just said, we don't have a policy. We put it on the agenda to develop a policy. I, I think we should. Well, I don't think we need to put it on the development policy. In that portion, we would direct it to a committee to, 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 to begin to develop a policy. So we don't need to come back and tell them how we're going to develop a policy at the next board meeting. We already know that we need to develop a policy. We don't have one. We just need to develop a policy. We need to take a committee to begin to think through what a policy elements would look like, bring it back to the board, and the board decide it. The other piece that you're talking about, okay, I can see. We can bring that back. But the policy is how we talk about it. I don't see why we need to talk about coming back and talk about it again. Let me withdraw my motion and I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to make it less compound. Let me make a first motion. So we put the issue of the, of the Choco House on uh, an upcoming agenda. I'll second that there's discussion. I think that um, Chuck brings up some good issues. I think that this is probably something that I would send to the strategic committee. I mean, because I think there are multiple issues here. Well, I'm just dealing with the right now. No, I know. But I'm just saying that I, I mean, because there are multiple issues, I think that this this property should be in the strategic committee. There's, I think there's no, I don't. So, so we have a, a motion by Director Bernstein, seconded by Director McLaughlin. Director Solano kind of did too, but that's okay. And um, to have this on the next. Board meeting agenda? Okay. So that's what I that's what I have. Right. Okay. So we're discussing it and that's I just stated my opinion. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so call the vote all in favor. Aye. All opposed. I'd like to then make my second motion, please. Um, I'd like us to uh, and we can certainly start at a committee level, but I would like to eventually Perhaps after committee review, I'll leave that to the discretion of the chair. I'd like to have at a future board meeting discussion of staff policy, which could start at a committee level. Discuss staff yeah. policy. I'm sorry, staff housing policy. Oh. I think it's directed to the So we had a specific item on the agenda tonight. If we, we want to submit that for a proposed agenda item for next month, 
that would be appropriate. This is just for to discuss the 1457 Chilco. So unless no, I, I separated it, it was all part of one thing. It's a proposed, just a proposed, well, Eddie, I don't the chief's know. Chief's rationale for this, the chief's rationale has been that it was for staff housing, and that's, this is a, this is telegraphic, this is a new issue, it's part of the Choco House issue. That the policy is different than the Choco House, and what you would make a reference to was the actual maintenance that took place. It, it drew in the policy at the, at the, at the secondary not part of the agenda, so we're going to make it part of a proposed item for the next meeting. Uh, I mean, ideally, that item should just go directly into a committee to start looking at. But if you want to bring it back on the agenda item to start talking about putting it back on the agenda item at some of the point, that's when I'm discussing it. Which takes way to me, it's out of order. So you don't need to bring it back on the agenda again.
I make a motion that the development of a housing policy be sent to the strategic planning committee and then brought back to the board as a whole. something in your, like your general orders or operational orders that talk about the vehicles that you need for service and the different parameters and you know what each vehicle would be used for. Well we have we have the well, procurement I know we have the policy that we have for three vendor bid. In terms of the types of vehicles that we use, I think we have some loose parameters around that. Because, and the reason why I put this on here is because I saw from the apparatus committee, they've got it well done, but is it the paper, you know, like the sizing of, so uh, like, it, like storage, like the Pierce, uh, do all the Pierce vehicles have a particular pump or a particular horsepower, you know, they have it, but right. it or engines or specifications. And but is it, truck. is it written in like a S SOP or something? I just want to interject it, as mentioned previously. The question is whether or not this should be an agenda, right. as opposed to having a lot of question answer and data gathering now on the underlying subject. If, with all due respect, if, if that's really the issue before the board at the moment. Then I propose that we have a discussion 
on the procurement procedures for district vehicles. Yeah. I have a second. I'll second that. Okay. Any other further discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. So, so we need to fight discussion, <laughs> Rob. Do you, yeah. do you mean that this goes on to a future agenda? A future agenda? Is that what you're talking about in terms of discussion? I just want well, to clarify. What you're discussing now, this is the reason why I put it on there for it to be a, a future agenda. So basically, right. your motion is to put this on the future agenda. Right. Exactly. Is that sure. I just want to ask general assets of you. Do you think the discussion of your number 14, where you say other issues with apparatus, is close enough to this that you just could be part of that same procedure? Yeah, the district vehicles and the apparatus all They're related. And fire engines. And vehicles doesn't include fire engines? It doesn't include it. It's, it's, it's all well, it's included. Any further discussion? Okay. Any further discussion? Good vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that motion carries. Motion. Okay, uh, no more the, the uh, reports, reports requests. Given the number of facilities that we have to build, uh, 
that I'm not clear why we get different architects for every facility. I'm not saying that the outside of cosmetics have to look the same, but I think the inside, for the most part, should be comparable, and there's no reason to re-educate new, new architects every time. And we ought to have to talk about somehow doing better on the facilities. There may be other things as well. So I'd like to have a study session where we get educated on the facilities. That's one request. And the other request is something similar for the whole issue of electric infrastructure. Um, what we know about panels, um, what we know about batteries, the extent to which we ought to be accommodating this at our facilities, whether on the roof, whether on covered parking, whatever it might be. And uh, that potentially has an impact I'm not suggesting that we do this, but it has an impact on trees and whether we maintain trees and things like that. And I just think it would be helpful to understand that before we get our next proposal for a new facility. So those are my two requests for the next meeting.
for the director. Jim uh, is working with me, uh, so if you would call uh, that, uh, uh, trying to see what we do, the extent of what it is together, we try to come up with uh, to make the meeting better and fun to do it. Leadership over subcommittees and decision on the uncertainty of the way So I just want you to have that so that you know, Jim Claudia is kind of what that's all about. And in the name of the President's group. Yes, sir. Would you discuss, please, with the attorney the issue of discussing committee business with one of the people? I'm saying this because if a committee is that and there are two people there, if you come in and then talk to one of the people about it, now that's a, that's a serial meeting. So you have to be very careful about how you do that. I just want to make sure you get guidance on that. Okay. Well, actually, I think Director Bernstein summarized it very well. You would just, uh, three is the meeting. Three has to be publicly noticed. And uh, so you have to be very careful if you've got more than two talking on an issue, right. even if it's in succession, which can create a serial meeting, as, as just stated. Anything else on the agenda for the day? Public comment number three. No public comment number three. Then I will leave the gavel to move to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? All right. Opposed?